Today, we are speaking with Esther Liu. Esther wrote this incredible book, Shame, Being Known and Loved. I guess you can't see it right now on the on my camera because it's blurry, but um, it is here. I have it with me and I reviewed it for Sola. You can read the review on our website. Um, but Esther, thank you for joining us today. Would you please introduce yourself and um, maybe tell us about how this book uh, got started? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I... Um, maybe we'll start off by saying that I am like a fangirl of Sola. So I'm trying to keep my composure right now the best that I can. Um, but my name is Esther. Um, as Aaron said, I am a faculty member and counselor at CCEF, which stands for the Christian Counseling and Educational Foundation um, in Glenside, Pennsylvania. Um, my yeah, I guess brief introduction. My parents are immigrants from Taiwan. I was born in upstate New York. Um, and then moved to central New Jersey in middle school and was there all the way through undergrad and then moved to the suburbs of Philadelphia when I started seminary at Westminster. Um, and this was totally not the life plan, but ended up staying um, in the suburbs of Philly way after seminary. So started working at CCEF and have been here ever since. Um, in terms of faith journey, I guess, yeah, I didn't grow up in a Christian family. Um, I became a Christian in college through friends who brought me to a campus fellowship and church. Um, and yeah, my life was really transformed through those years. Um, those years are really formative for me, um, including, yeah, I guess my struggle with shame um, that has been a part of my life since I was young. And yeah, those experiences show up in the devotional. So that's kind of who I am um, to your question of like how the book began or how it got started. Um, to this day, I am still caught off guard. Like the whole thing was very surreal and unexpected. I do not, I did not. And I still, I guess maybe I should now, but I didn't at the time consider myself a writer. Um, I've never written blogs. I, I mean, I wrote papers for school. Um, but I think the extent of my writing mostly was just like writing in my personal journal, like dear diary type stuff. And so the fact that um, this opportunity came around for me is still um, a story that makes me laugh because it just seems very absurd. But essentially I had scribblings of notes <clears throat> for a conference that I was preparing for um, in Atlanta back in 2020. And it was going to be on shame. Um, but then because of COVID, um, the conference actually got canceled very last minute. And so I just had all this preparation work that I didn't know what to do with um, in light of the conference being canceled. So I just typed it all up in just a random Word document so that it wouldn't go to waste. Um, and it was just living as a random Word document for, I guess, six months, nine months. And it was never really going to see the light of day. Um, but I guess after six to nine months, I was asked for some writing samples because um, I work at CCEF. And so, um, yeah, the Dean of Faculty had asked me for some writing samples and I just submitted what, yeah, this random Word document because I didn't have anything else to submit. Um, <clears throat> he ended up reading it and he responded saying, Esther, like, I think you should consider getting this material published. Um, would you consider that? Would you be interested in that? Wow. And my response was, um, no, it's okay. Um, not really interested. I'm not really a writer. That's never been like on my to-do list to write a book. So kind of turned him down in a sense. Um, and then he kind of continued pushing gently. And then eventually was like, would you give me permission to reach out to publishers on your behalf if you wouldn't do it yourself? Wow. So I did end up giving him permission um, it ended up with PNR, and so somehow that became a book contract, um, which then miraculously eventually turned into an actual devotional. So, don't really know how that happened. I must have like blacked out through parts of the process because it was hard. Um, but it is a book now. That's awesome. I I, I don't think I I don't remember hearing that story before. That's amazing. Um, it's okay. So what's super interesting to me is that you said that like, you're not like really a writer, but I mean, your book is really good. And it's funny because you said that you, you, you like the only writing you really do is like in your journal. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the book is a 31 day devotional 
and you know the chapters are really short it's meant to be like done over like this period of time so I don't know yeah. to me your journal writing seems like the perfect fit I think God was preparing you all along <laughs> hmm. I never thought of it that way that's actually a really <laughs> sweet thought hmm. um you okay so you went to seminary you said right um, mm-hmm. so how did you start seeing shame this way in the bible did you did you understand shame uh like this before seminary did it happen during seminary where you started um you know reading it this way when did that happen exactly yeah i would say um probably one of the most prominent influences on my understanding of how scripture talks about shame is through um, Dr. Ed Welch, who okay. is also a faculty member and counselor at CCEF right. and um, wrote the book Shame Interrupted. I guess that came out, I don't even know how long ago, but mm. that book and just um, sitting under his teaching as a counseling student during my seminary years really opened my eyes to see how shame and that struggle that issue is really everywhere in scripture Mm. um and so it's interesting because i think before that i maybe had a more proof texty view of shame so it's like if i like type shame in biblegateway.com and like see which (laughs) verses came up (laughs) um yeah yeah. and so i feel like those were the verses to me that were like oh here's where the bible talks about shame and so you think of like Hebrews 12 2, where it talks about, you know, Jesus Christ, the founder and perfecter of our faith, Mm -hmm. despising the shame, et cetera. And so that word shows up. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it was really Dr. Welch and even just, yeah, my own seminary studies, realizing that it really is everywhere. And even if that word doesn't explicitly show up, um, you see it in various narratives where it's not going to say shame explicitly, but you know that the struggles that they're experiencing is very much shame. Right, so you right, right. have Leah in the Old yes. Testament, yeah. um, who's trying to earn her love, earn, earn Jacob's love um, by through childbearing, or you think of all the people who are outcasts and rejects in society who Jesus moved towards and welcomed mm-hmm. and fellowship mm-hmm. with, and mm-hmm. people who felt like sinners beyond the hope of grace. Um, that Jesus paved a way forward for. So when you think of those things, like I think it's been really sweet to deepen in my understanding that shame really is everywhere in scripture from Genesis to Revelation, um, which I think speaks to the God who cares about shame from Genesis to Revelation, which I think gives hope to people who struggle with it of like, he has something so beautiful to say about this human experience that can be so life- um impacting for so many people yeah um the example of leah really stood out to me when i read it in your book i don't i don't know what it was but i think at, the way that you laid it out was was perfect i think mm. um part of it has to do with like for me like obviously i'm not a woman right so you know whatever man woman differences there are like I, mm. I can't see it that way um but you helped bring that to life and obviously the the different cultural differences that are just inherent in that story um brought it to life too and so I, I really enjoyed the fact that you did span the entire biblical story um to show how shame is throughout the bible um mm. uh, with your personal um insight though how does being an asian american christian or even your own personal story um impact how you relate to shame like I don't know if like you know you being a woman made you like realize like oh yeah Leah might have felt this way or whatever you know but just yeah in general like how how do you see um your personal story like um intertwining with what you wrote about in the book Mm, yeah so you had sent the questions in advance and I I read this question before and I was like oh this is a really good question um and I think as I was thinking about it and processing it I think I realize how much I still have yet to understand how Mm. my Asian American Christian identity played a role or how it shaped and impacted the writing um, and what ended up in the book. But I think what was clear, what I am aware of is that it's probably on every single page of the devotional in some sense without me consciously saying like, okay, this is where my Asian Americanness comes in. Right, um, right, right. But given that, you know, um, Asian culture is like honor shame and my parents were raised in that culture. And so the way they parented me was shaped by that. And so my upbringing, my formative years, 
just culturally that has to just be in some sense like the air that I breathed right. in ways that I might not even be fully conscious of and fully understand to this day. Right. Um, but yeah, I was thinking, I was trying to think of an example of like the degree of my awareness of yeah. how my Asian American identity played a role in kind of how my particular um, struggle with shame, how that like came to be. Mm. But I don't know, I don't know if people can relate or if you can relate, but I grew up kind of there being a lot of family parties where yeah. like all these families would come together, like all the adults, all the kids, and there'd be like an adult table and there'd be a kid table. Yeah. And we'd just like <laughs> hang out and it'd just be like all night and just such a ruckus and like good food and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think one of the things that I remember about those family parties, aside from just having a blast with the other kids, um, was kind of that um, dynamic where the parents are all together and they're all chatting and kind of catching up on things mm -hmm. and um, sometimes like as a kid you like kind of overhear some of those conversations and what they're talking about mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times inevitably you know they would talk about the kids like my child you know is doing well in school and oh mm -hmm. my child got first chair in you know mm -hmm. the symphony orchestra or like mm -hmm oh yeah, my daughter just got into an Ivy League and, or like, oh yeah, my son just, you know, just got this job. Mm. And so it kind of like with the appropriate modesty, I think that's appropriate to Asian culture. There is kind of that, like, or even like, oh, I heard your son, you know, just landed this amazing job as a doctor or something like that. Mm. Um, those conversations would play out. And then I think as a child, like being particularly sensitive to, I still remember like that experience of how that subtly got internalized in me mm, mm, of just mm. like you like there's a way to measure up to be worthy to be bragged about at this adult table in this mm. adult conversation mm. um there's a there's like a way there's like a formula there are standards that I can meet to be someone that would be spoken well of at this adult table which mm. I think then just becomes a metaphor for um the entirety of life it's beyond just you know the family party adult table but like I think that is kind of a a specific example of where I started to learn and kind of internalize um this reality of like oh there are certain things that I can succeed in in order to make my parents proud of me mm -hmm. um there are things that I do to earn that smile and that favor um and for I guess for me a lot of that was academic achievement or a uh, respectable career so on and so forth accomplishments etc and so that ended up being a huge part of my own shame journey that ends up coming out in the devotional I think just this notion of climbing ladders yeah. um, that I talk about and like if you climb higher on this ladder of achievement of accomplishments of building your resume of social skills of attractiveness like if you just climb this ladder and if you climb high enough you'll be good enough and you'll be worthy and you'll measure up um, and if you don't climb that ladder successfully, you end up being the kid that like none of the adults really want to talk about because it's like, it's like, yeah, we don't, we don't need to talk about this black sheep of the family. Um, and as someone who had an older brother who was very intelligent and competent mm. and capable, I was definitely the one who was like struggling to keep up and like, oh, like I want to measure up and I want to be better. Um, and I think that ended up being a huge part of just my own journey and how that became a paradigm for my entire life of feeling wow. like I need to toil and strive to be enough and to measure up to make people love me or approve of me. So I don't know, just like one si maybe somewhat silly example okay. of how my Asian Americanness um, and and shame kind of interface. No, that is that is not silly at all. I can relate to that one hundred percent. And um, I'm gonna go and think about that after we're done with this. Now. <laughs> uh, thank you for sharing that, Esther. That's 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 really good. And I think a lot of people will be be able to benefit from hearing you say that in your own words too. Mm. Um, uh, Despite your book being about shame, um, the subtitle is Being Known and Loved. And yeah. I found your book to be um, incredibly hopeful. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, um, is this a message um, that you, I don't know, subconsciously thought we needed to hear today? I, I mean, after hearing the background of, of how the book came about, I mean, it sounds like you were just preparing a talk, right? Like from what you were studying. <laughs> um, yeah. But like, how do, how do you think that this message can be maybe beneficial for um, either Asian American Christians or just Christians 
in general today? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, honestly, when I was writing it, I didn't know if it'd be helpful. And that was part of the struggle of writing. It's like, is this going to be helpful at all? <laughs> um, and I think what helped me endure those dark nights of the soul and writing of like, I don't think mm -hmm. this is going to be of any use um, is... I think I would often remind myself, it's like, Esther, you don't know like how helpful it will be to readers. Like you can't really control that. You don't know who's going to end up um, having their hands on it, who's going to end up reading it. Right. Um, and so when I started thinking about like readers as a whole, I would get very overwhelmed and be like, you know, I have nothing to say that would be helpful or um, whatnot, or there are so many other books that would be more helpful. But mm. I think what kept me going was thinking about like, what is a book that like younger Esther could have used mm. when she was struggling with shame? Yeah. And um, what, what does she need to hear? And like, what, what would give her hope and courage mm. to continue persevering, even when shame for me, like at times felt very paralyzing and crippling. And so I kind of wrote the book kind of um, thinking about that a lot, just like, I don't know how helpful it will be to readers, but I, I, Hope that it'd be helpful to a younger version of myself and kind of mm -hmm. wrote in that sense mm -hmm. but I think what has been so sweet since the book has come out you know the writing process is very isolating in a sense like for a long time no one really reads it except you yourself and you um <laughs> and like the editors eventually get involved like um I was blessed to have friends who are willing to give it a read um, during the editing phases to give me feedback mm -hmm. but in some sense like it is kind of an isolating you don't really have a ton of feedback from readers but I think what's been really sweet as the book has come out is the messages that I've received from people who have been reading it mm -hmm. and I think from their response that's when it hit me of well this devotional can actually be helpful to people I don't think I knew that or thought that or believed that until I actually received messages from people of how it was shaping and transforming their lives. Um, I think part of that is, you know, obviously scripture being beautiful and God being beautiful and mm -hmm. Christ having beautiful words um, to say to shame-filled strugglers. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was also interesting that part of the hope journey was not just the pieces of the book that were explicitly trying to be hopeful and direct people to Jesus. But part of the hopefulness that people experienced was feeling they felt less alone mm. as they were reading through it. Yeah. And I think maybe because like so much of my personal experience was in there and I was pretty transparent with that. I think just the fact that people feel felt less alone and isolated in their struggle with shame mm. and that being such a meaningful piece of the healing in the shame process was really precious for me to hear about um, because I think inherent to shame is this isolation and this hiding and this, I'm not good enough, so don't look at me. Um, I'm just going to withdraw and hide and cover up and all these things. And um, so just to hear how the book brought about hope, even in that sense was really, that wasn't intended. I don't think, I don't think I realized that as I was writing it, but mm. it became such a um, beautiful testimony of the Lord kind of doing that work without me even realizing that would be part of the hope, the trajectory towards hope for readers. Yeah. yeah. But I hope yeah. it'll be helpful. That's all yeah, I can say. I, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it is. Um, I looked at the website recently. It, it ran out of pressings. So I think it's on another or it ran out of copies. So I think you're on another pressing of this one. So yeah. congrats on that. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's, it's going to be great. And the entire, you know, I'm actually a fan of the entire series of books of, mm. um, you know, this uh, 31 day devotionals for life. And I think yeah. your entry in this is, is definitely um, one of the better ones that I've read in there. <laughs> so thanks for, for writing it. Um, mm. Thanks. Okay, Aaron. So, yeah. Okay. So I think in the book, you mentioned that like, obviously 31 days is not like enough right time to to like I don't know go over like somebody's yeah. shame journey right from a counseling perspective yeah um, and I I think that um it's it's interesting because you also said like uh I guess there's this meta narrative of you like trying to you know as you're writing and how you felt like isolated and alone in it um how has the journey of writing this book impacted you personally um 
in regards mm. to shame and your faith. And I mm. think for for this one, yeah, you can talk about, you know, whatever, some of the things that you talked about in the book, if you're comfortable with it too. Um, mm. But yeah, I guess it's it's like a processing question. Yeah, how, how did the, the writing uh, impact you? Yeah. I remember when I was working on the book and people would be checking in on me and asking me how it's going, how I'm doing. Mm. I often responded with like, I'm writing a book on shame and all I feel is shame. Like mm-hmm. that was literally my journey of writing this book. Yeah. I don't think there's another word that captures better, like what the journey, how to encapsulate the journey in one word for me is shame. Mm-hmm. Um, and the first sentence of the introduction of the devotional is like, this book was almost not written. Yes. Um, I and I said that because it was true. Like there are so many times I wanted to give up. There are so many times I was so sure that I was not qualified, competent enough, good enough, skilled enough things. Um, And it just made me want to throw in the towel and be like, I can't do this. Like, I'm not cut out for this. I don't have what it takes. Um, And I feel like that followed me from the very beginning to the very end Mm -hmm. of the book writing journey. Um, And so it's just so interesting how the lord does that where he's like you're writing a book on shame and i wanted to feel like an expert on it like i Mm. wanted to come from the perspective of a counselor who has helped many people who have struggled with shame and in some sense that is me and that's Mm -hmm. part of my story and my life experience Mm -hmm. um but instead i felt like the lord was like i don't want you to write this book out of a place of being an expert on shame Mm -hmm. um but as someone who struggled with it and knows what it's like and as someone who has needed the very words that are written on these pages as much as anyone else will need them Mm -hmm. um and so that was a very humbling experience and um i i almost wish it could be different maybe at the time i wish it could be different but now in hindsight that's part of the richness and the beauty for me of what the journey was Mm -hmm. um But yeah, I think I'm really grateful that the book has almost like encapsulates the journey of writing it. Like there's something special about that, um, Mm. that I can't really put into words, but the hope, the courage, the comfort that I so want readers to experience more through Christ via this devotional, those were the very things that I needed and that I experienced writing the book. Yeah. And I think if anything that I've learned from this whole experience and writing it and how it has impacted me, um, this will forever be a testimony of what it means to simply do my best to be faithful however I can, to do my best, not knowing if it'll fall short or not, not knowing if it'll succeed or not, not knowing what the outcome will be but wanting so much to be faithful unto the Lord Mm -hmm. with the smallness that I have and the smallness that I am. And to be able to see how the Lord is able to use that for good. Um, And so I remember, yeah, like I've, I I was telling someone like, I cry so often these days, but they're not sad tears. They're happy tears because I receive, yeah, these messages again of how this book is impacting people and it's beyond what I could have asked or imagined. But I think that's what I want for all of us is that there are so many of us who don't feel good enough. And, you know, for me, it was like for years playing it safe and not wanting to put myself out there and not wanting to try and then to fail and humiliate myself. So I'd rather not try at all. Um, but I think from this experience and this journey, what I've learned and what I hope I'll carry with me for the rest of my life and ministry is to have the courage to take those baby steps of obedience, take those baby steps of faith and faithfulness um, and to be able to see how the Lord uses that to bless other people. Um, So hopefully, yeah, moving forward, I'll have just an ounce more courage to continue doing um, the hard things that the Lord puts my way and um, to trust that there can be beautiful things that come out of that. Esther, that's great. That's so good. Thank you so much. I can't think of a better way to end our conversation than with what you just said. Um, and I, I pray that this conversation will be a blessing and and further 
the reach of your book and and your writing ministry um your your yeah thank you so much for your time mm, thank you so much aaron this was a blast